Who decided what went into the Bible? It's one of the great questions of history. People who want to know about the Bible want to know, well, if there were 40 plus authors over 1500 years, who decided which of those authors got in and how, and how did that all come together? Well, in the Old Testament, the story starts with the conclusion of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and most of Deuteronomy. And as he's getting almost done with it, the Lord says to him in Deuteronomy 31, 26, take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. There it will remain as a witness. So apparently Moses did that. He put it next to the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord in the Holy of Holies. And over time, as other books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, etc., were recognized as being from God, a copy of those was placed inside of the Ark as well. Now, during the period of the exile of Israel, which takes place a couple hundred years later, uh, they no longer have the temple anymore. So Ezra the scribe, who loves the word of God, sets up a whole new system to unify Israel. And the system is built around the word of God. Instead of having a temple to worship at, they have synagogues in each of their cities. Synagogue simply means assembly. And in each of those synagogues, they would have a copy of each scroll of the Old Testament, from which they had a regular rotation of reading and then preaching and all of that. The scrolls were put in a special chamber and pulled out and read. You see in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus reads the Isaiah scroll, rolls it back up and puts it away in the synagogue he's in, in Nazareth there. So that's how the Old Testament came about. When the New Testament starts being written, Christianity is a loose group of people. It's actually, uh, over time, outlawed for the first 300 years. It, it is an illegal movement, so people have to go underground, but they gathered as churches. And when someone would write a decent book, or a really decent, an authoritative book, that book would get copied and read at other churches. So there's a sifting process going on. They might read a book and say that was okay. And then another book, say the letter to the Colossians comes to them, they go, wow, that letter was anointed. We gotta keep a copy of that. We gotta make a copy for some others. And so over time, the church together, in effect, figured out which books God had his hand on and which he didn't. So the ones that weren't as good didn't get copied as much uh, or were spoken against by others. And the ones that were definitely anointed then got used more and more and talked about more and more. Uh, because the church wasn't legal, there was no ability for them to get together and make rulings, though, on what books were in or out. So a lot of things happened by circumstance in the first 300 years. For instance, in about 140 AD, a merchant by the name of Marcion decided he would develop his own list of what was scripture and what wasn't completely rejected the Old Testament, used part of the book of Luke, 10 of Paul's letters, and another letter purportedly written by Paul to the Alexandrians. He said, this is scripture. Well, Marcion was a Gnostic. It was a competitive religion to Christianity back then. And in 144 AD, the Church of Rome looked at him, his teachings, and his list, and said, no, this is wrong, and they excommunicated him. So sometimes the church did things because it had to in response to what was going on in its culture. For instance, uh, about that same time, from 156 to 172 AD, a very charismatic uh, teacher came on the scene named Montanus. And Montanus began to teach that there was new revelation, that he was the new prophet, that this was the time of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus' time had passed, and so there were new things that God was saying through new writings. The church immediately responded to that and said, no, that's not true. In fact, it was at that time, again, in informal dialogues, but church leader to church leader to church leader, they decided the canon was closed, that there were no more revelations, no more definitive books to be added to this. So again, part of what happened was the church in reaction to the culture was defining its own books by necessity. We have in the Vatican uh, a, a manuscript, a fragment called the Muratorian fragment, because it was found in their library there by a priest named Muratorius, from we think about 190 AD that includes almost every book that we would currently consider part of the New Testament, plus a couple of books that we think aren't, like the Gospel of Peter and such. That one comes pretty close to a documented list of, okay, by 190, they've made pretty much all their decisions. But again, they weren't legally 
able to make decisions until 313 AD when Constantine legalized Christianity. After that, you see councils meeting together and they, they decided pretty definitively what was scripture and what wasn't. So by 367 AD, Athanasius printed a list in his Christmas sermon, and that's our list for this day. There was an official ruling at one of the councils in 393 AD. Those are the books that we would now consider canonical, part of the New Testament, part of God's revelation to us. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul begins to build a description of what should be accepted as scriptural and what shouldn't. He says that the church, uh, Jesus' movement, is, quote, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So if you look in a table of contents in your Bible, you'll discover that almost every book therein was written by an apostle or a prophet or someone with a link to one of them. Over time, as they sifted through what was scripture and what wasn't, they came up with five definitive markers for every book of the Bible. We call these the marks of canonicity because canon is the Greek word for a reed or a straight line or a measuring ruler. These are the ones that measure straight. The marks of canonicity are, was the Bible or was the book written by a prophet of God? Was the writer confirmed by acts of God? Does the message tell the truth of God? Did it come with the power of God? And was it accepted by God's people? You look at every book in the Bible, and just about all of them have all five of those. Some, like the book of Hebrews, only have four because we're not sure who wrote it, but there's nothing against it in it. It bears the marks of God, the truth of God, the, the hand of God. People have affirmed that over time. And again, by 393, they said, these are the books we believe in. That's how it came about.